Good evening. Tonight is the um, regular monthly board meeting. Tonight is um, August 2nd, to 2021. Um, and this is the monthly board meeting of the Concord School Board. Um, I'll call it to order and then um, ask Ms. Cannon, would you please call the roll for attendance? Certainly. Ms. Hastings. Here. I believe Ms. Higgins has already noticed that she would be running a little late. Uh, Mr. Parker is not with us yet. Mr. Richards? Here. Ms. Smith? Here. Ms. Walsh? Here. Mr. Weinberg? Here. Ms. West? Here. And I am here. We are a quorum. Okay, very good. So um, the next order of business will be approval of the agenda. Does anyone have any amendments, uh, modifications, or changes to the agenda that they would like to propose? Not seeing a motion to, to that effect, would uh, someone care to make a motion to approve the agenda as written and published? So moved. Moved by Ms. Walsh. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Hastings. Uh, is there any discussion? All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Are there any abstentions? The agenda has been approved. Um, with that, uh, the next item is the approval of board minutes for the monthly meeting of July 6th. Does anyone have any uh, uh, modifications or amendments or changes to the board minutes from last month? Not seeing any. I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the last board meeting. So moved. Moved by Ms. Smith. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all right, seconded <laughs> by Mr. Weinberg. <laughs> Um, any discussion? All right. All those in Any opposed? Any abstentions? The minutes have been approved. Um, with that, we'll move to the next item, which is recognitions and reports we'll list, uh, from the superintendent. Superintendent, are you prepared <coughs> to give us our August report? I am, Mr. Richards. Thank you. I'll thank you. hand it um, off to you. Thank you. Um, so tonight, I'd like to report to you on the district plans for returning to school uh, on September 1st, in case anyone has forgotten that date. Um, Wednesday, September 1st, we, uh, we uh, wait with open arms for all of our youngsters to return to school. Just give you an idea about some of the planning that's happening in the district right now. We have plans uh, right now with our principals and our department heads. We will be spending two days with them on August 16th and 17th. Um, in preparation for uh, return to school. Um, we'll be talking about obviously the plans that are in place and all of the precautions and safety protocols uh, that we will look at, we will discuss with them. But there's so many other pieces of things that have happened over the year. You know, all the new legislation, we'll spend time with that. We'll be reviewing plans like the suicide plan. We have um, time set aside to discuss data, um, recent data. And I'm talking about all kinds of data, uh, student attendance, staff attendance. Uh, so these two days are really meant to um, review as well as plan for the new year um, and, and begin to really um, uh, delve into their own goals. What are the goals for everybody in, in at their building, but that also represent the efforts of this of the district in terms of what we need to do for the youngsters. So we'll do that August 16th and 17th. Um, we will be holding those meetings here in scheduled on August 24th and 25th. We have new teacher orientation slash onboarding. Um, and uh, those that two days will again uh, review all of the uh, systems that we have for new teachers. That includes um, uh, their curriculum, special education, uh, their their um, use of technology. There'll be a whole piece on that. I know that the teachers association always does a piece with them and has an an ice cream smorgasbord just so teachers get to know new teachers and get to know each other. Uh, I, I haven't extended the invitation yet, but I would hope that our president, Mr. Richards, will join us and um, he will <coughs> welcome all the new staff uh, that we uh, have uh, elected for contracts this year to be with us. So, uh, Jim, I hope you'll be able to join us. I'll give you more details as, we, as it unfolds. Thank you. If it's at all possible, I'll be happy to. Yeah, that would be great. 
We follow that up with a two days of openings, all staff. That will happen on August 30th and, August, and the 31st. Again, the focus will be on updating them on, on current um, activities in the district, the return to school. We'll also be addressing any new legislation that impacts the, their teaching and certainly learning. Uh, we'll also, we, this year we really want to focus on teachers giving them time to work with each other. That's really important. You know, last year was such an abbreviated year. They were in, they were out, um, they were hybrid, and we really want them to be able to spend some time planning with their teams, because they're all part of a team or a department, uh, and begin to lay out the plans for the year. So that, that was really important. Uh, we will, however, we will come together as a, an entire district, and again, I'm going to invite our president, um, Jim Richards, to join us in welcoming our staff back. And there are some awards and some um, achievement things that we want to talk about and um, present uh, that day, too. So we're looking for, um, uh, we're finalizing plans for a keynote speaker to come in uh, and meet with the teachers. So. I think we'll have two days of uh, packed information for them, and then again, kick off on uh, September 1st. So it's kind of exciting times for all of us. If I could um, talk about pr preparations underway for our opening on September 1st, and if I could, Matt's with us, Matt Cashman, and so, Donna, could you put those slides up? Matt would like to um, give you a little idea about some of the things that we did over the summer in preparation. Now, this is all around building preparation. Matt's I'm, I'm here. Where are they, Matt? I was looking for you over at the table. Well, this is just an overview. We had 40 total jobs, a little over 40 jobs, when we started this summer on June 21st. Um, we had about 51 W days or 10 weeks to accomplish all of this and as we all know rain has been pretty challenging on a lot of the outside work that we've done. Um, Donna if you want to go to the ne next slide you, most of you are probably aware and have seen we've done the, the roof upgrade here so we there's some pictures of the roof being stripped off. Um, this job started in mid-July and on Wednesday will complete. Uh, it's based around a lot of safety, so we've put up gutters, which we never had before. We're putting downspouts. We're gonna have all the snow melt going through those systems and going into the storm drains to keep the ice from forming on the outside of the parking lots. Again, just to increase safety and, and the roof desperately needed it, as many of you know. And the next one. We, uh, this one's a pretty fun project. I see Mike and Steve from the high school. We, uh, the front of Concord High looks a lot different. The center picture there is a heated ramp that's about 109 feet long and 18 feet wide. And on either side of that, we've added pavers. So it's about 4,000 square feet. On the right-hand side of the photo, that's what, uh, outside of the cafeteria. So we have some extended food court and on the other side, on the left side, is outside of the library. So I think on the new teacher orientation, we're going to try to use that outside space. It will be, it's, it's ready essentially now. Um, that's a little bit older of a photo, but um, that's something we're pretty excited about. We've increased some outside space and made it much, much safer. But if you can see the two orange pylons, cones, the uh, sidewalk has been in really tough shape at Beaver Meadow. So last year we replaced the far end sidewalk that was about in the same shape, and this year we're going to do that. And that, that job should start midweek this week and be done by next week. Go ahead. Oh, um, so no, 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 sorry. Yeah, so some other things really quick while I'm talking about it. Um, in about two weeks, all of the elementaries, we've been doing this year after year, but broken ground LED conversion will be complete, making all of our, um, you know, the district office and all the elementaries all uh, up to speed with LED upgrades. And we also uh, added, we talked about it earlier in the year, we added security cameras and uh, card access stations 
to RMS making all of our schools with cameras and with card reader access for safety and security. There's more to mention, but I know we have a lot on the agenda tonight, if anyone has any questions. Okay. Um, no, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, Mr. Cashman, I have to say that having uh, experienced both the, uh, the downpour of rain here at this building and the ice, as well as having uh, had to walk across the courtyard at the high school, uh, these were both very needed. Um, certainly the roof is, when the roof goes, you've got to replace your roof. Uh, I, uh, I applaud you on the adding more outdoor eating spaces with regards to the high school. Um, I think the students have asked for that, and I think it, uh, the project's good. I look forward to seeing it. Um, I don't have any other questions. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Cashman? Everything on budget and yes, yes, it is, yeah. exactly. and on schedule. That that 50, uh, 51 days to get a lot of stuff with rain in yes. between almost mm -hmm. every day. That was tough, but everything's right on budget. And then uh, along the well, you didn't mention it, and and uh, did we have some upgrades of uh, infrastructure with regards to wireless or to um, network items there at all? And if so, is that going to be completed in time for school and are there any issues or budgetary issues associated with that um, you know Pam McLeod our IT director she's mm -hmm. been doing some upgrades but I think um, we could probably get back to you on the specifics okay. on all of those what she's planned for the summer okay and um, interior work like painting and some of those things where so do we stand on a that? lot of these jobs that I talked about tonight were focused around mm -hmm. safety mm -hmm. but flooring, all sorts of aesthetics, room upgrades, um, adding a robotics uh, area at the high school, adding a welcome uh, senior center at the high school. So yeah, there's, there's obviously a lot of painting and aesthetics. Okay. Ready for September 1? Yes, we are. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Continue, Superintendent. Thank you. Then I would like to um, really take a peek at our, um, pr our proposal. Again, a preliminary proposal. As you know, we had a responsibility to report to the Department of Ed in June around our, our focus for plans to return. All of those plans have been approved. Uh, the New Hampshire Department of Ed was approved by Washington for their plans, so the money from ESSA will now be um, released and uh, sent to us. We have half of it right now, but uh, New Hampshire's plans were based on the plans from the school district, so that it all worked out. But the guiding principles for our plan, we've always been, this has been our focus, is around the safety of our students and the well-being. We want to support um, our students, ensuring that they reach their attainment for their competencies at every grade level. Uh, obviously, we want to create and continue to create positive and inclusive schools um, and, and focus on the social and emotional growth. We all know, we've talked about it before, you have talked about it, you've expressed your concerns around the fact of last, the last 18 months and how difficult that has been on our students. And so social emotional growth is really important to us when, as the children return. <coughs> Um, and we need to um, keep our eye on the vulnerable populations, um, those um, students who um, really during the pandemic really uh, missed out on a lot of opportunities uh, and uh, around their learning and again around what we expect of our students at particular grade levels. Um, we also want to uh, continue to ensure equity, make sure that all students have access and opportunity and that's really important. Um, it was important during the uh, pandemic when we were closed and shut down in remote or in hybrid, but it is just as important as that all the students return to us in September. And that we continue to have ongoing and clear communication with our stakeholders. That means our students, our staff, and our families, uh, and the community in general to um, make sure they know what's going on. So we will continue to focus on those guiding principles. What the, if we could go to the next slide, we will prioritize full-time in-person learning. And based, you know what that means. That's all students returning to school full-time in person. Um, but we will talk about some options that may be available. So we'll continue to do that. 
We will continue to monitor COVID. You're going to see in a minute some slides that we put together, recent data. Um, so we will continue to monitor those conditions, not only for our schools, but for Concord in, as the city, as well as the county of Merrimack. And you know that's how all that information is reported to us. We'll continue to um, use all of our prevention strategies to uh, minimize any uh, uh, transmission within our schools. Um, and um, based on vaccination rates and other kinds of information that we have. And of course, we will use guidance um, from the New Hampshire Department of Education, Health and Human Services, and as we will continue, uh, the CDC, of course, and we will continue to uh, consult with uh, Dr. Noble, who has been of great assistance to us throughout, throughout the pandemic. I just wanted to give you an idea about some of the things that are happening um, across daily trends of COVID cases in New Hampshire. Um, this is as of July 30th, uh, which was the last um, best data that we had, and um, the, the cases over the last seven days. You can see there's a slight it, it uptick. If you look at that red line, you'll see that there has been a slight uh, uptick of cases in New Hampshire, and I think that you've probably seen that when we on the news uh, and, and general information. <clears throat> if you continue down, you'll t uh, the next slide shows the cases across the country, and certainly New Hampshire has continues to do a good job in trying and making efforts to keep our numbers down. We certainly do not have the spike that the, that you're seeing uh, across the country uh, as it as it represents in that last um, that last spike uh, on this graph. Um, the next slide, we tried to show um, what, what, what are the cases look like, I'm sorry, the next slide, I almost skipped this one. Um, no, no, you, and you, you, we're on to the next one. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. Um, the next slide is, is how do we compare to other states um, relative to the number of cases reported, and each state has a different color. You'll see, if you can see the brown, and it's hard to see the brown, thanks. You'll see the brown, and it's right there on the line compared to everyone else. Um, and it's the seven-day moving average of new cases um, and, um, and, and reported by a 10-day average. Again, we're very, you know, very minimal uh, in New Hampshire. And sometimes we, you know, can get caught up in all the other data, but you have to kind of focus on where are you right now? Um, Concord, Merrimack County, New Hampshire. And that's the kind of information that we want to use uh, when we're trying to make decisions. Uh, then we looked at Merrimack County because obviously that we're you know, that's where we are and that's where a lot of our folks every day come from. And you can see again um, uh, a new uh, slight uh, in, uh, uptake on the number of cases. Uh, last 14 days, the average was 61 uh, cases. So we have seen an uptick. It was just a month ago. What did you say it was, Donna, about a month ago? About 30. 30. Well, in the 30s. In the 30s. So we are, we are seeing that uptick uh, in, uh, in our county. Right now, and just, just changed, by the way, to um, uh, we were in the green for a long time, minimal, if you remember, pretty much this summer we were green. And we just moved uh, to the level of transmission uh, in Merrimack County to moderate, and there's that 61 that I just referred to. Remember now that category, anything between 50 and 100 puts you in that moderate category. And so when we were 30, obviously we're in the minimal range. Um, and then uh, the, the positivity rate, um, that too has, has gone up a little bit. Um, it's still just a tad bit under the um, 5%. Um, rule so we kind of keep that's another factor that we keep an eye on and last we looked at vaccination rates now remember the vaccination rates are based on the po total population including children so you know children from 0 to 12 are not vaccinated but yet they're they're part of that total census data if you will when they're determining the percentage and in Concord, uh, based on the data that we received from the Department of Health and Human Services, 59% of the population uh, in Concord has been vaccinated. Merrimack County is 57%. So 
So I wanted you to just have a little background. That's the latest. But just remember, it changes every day, right? So I, 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 could, I could do this tomorrow, and it might look differently. But from this point of time tonight, uh, we, I thought it was important that you see what's happening around you. Uh, so we know that uh, during uh, the 2021 year, you had a remote model um, and a hybrid. Remote started in September. We moved to hybrid from October through April. Um, and uh, we uh, then came after April, I think it was April 19th, we came back full time uh, and we had all of our students uh, in school. We, we are, I, I want to be clear that our priority is to provide in-person learning for all of our students. And as you remember back in June, we had a survey that was done, and, and some of our parents, it was a very small number. At that point, it was like 27, 28 um, families indicated an interest in remote learning to continue with the remote learning. So part of our learning model, um, in addition to full-time in-person, would be to provide some remote access for our students. And we, we are recommending that we use the Virtual Learning Academy Charter School, um, which is obviously um, supported by the state of New Hampshire. Um, students enroll in, uh, in uh, VLAX, um, get the credits and, um, that everyone else gets. It's all managed and um, overseen by the Department of Ed. And the students who need special services, um, the district has to support those students if they have special services that are needed, special needs. Uh, relative to special education, so we, we are responsible for the, those students. Um, one of the things that we, we, the instruction committee talked about um, was how do we stay connected with those students who are, who are taking the option of remote learning? And we don't want to lose those students. We, we, still, we still want them to be part of the school district. They still have friends. They might even have, you know, they have kids on the same street, you know. So you want to figure out a way to stay connected. And so we're working on that to have an option where we would have a person at each building identified at each um, school site identified to oversee those students while they're at VLAX. Because some of them might want to participate in school activities. Let me give you an example. I just received a message around um, Girls on the Run. That's a program um, for girls that, that they do, they run and they have meets and all that kind of thing. It's elementary. And uh, that's after school. And if, 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 and they're outside. And so would, would they should be, um, have that opportunity to participate in some of those things, um, including our athletics and sports programs. Um, just as our homeschool families do and have that option to participate. So we want to make sure that we're going to provide them with assistance should they need it and make sure that they can access the programs that we offer all of our students in Concord. And I don't have to tell you, it's a wonderful after school programs that we have for our students. So that's the kind of learning model we'd like to present in person and our remote option via VLAX for students with support. Some of the health and safety strategies that we are, um, that we have wanted to discuss and suggested was the use of masks, physical distancing, um, which would be three feet, um, the hand washing, cleaning and disinfecting, ventilation, I'm going to go into each one of these a little bit, um, contact tracing, what does that mean, screening and diagnosis, and promoting vaccinations in the community. So the, the recommendations, let's start with masking. Recommendations for masking came from uh, several bodies. Um, the American Pediatric Association has recommended that anyone over the age of two years um, uh, and, and older in, at school, um, whether they're vaccinated or not, um, wear a mask. CDC has also recommended universal indoor masking for all teachers, staff, students, and visitors to K-12 schools, regardless of vaccination status, very similar to the American Pediatric Association. Um, and of course, the CDC is recommending that our students return uh, to school full-time 
uh, with the layered prevention strategies, and we'll get into more of those as we go through. And, and New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services really said you have to look at each district on your own. Look at what's happening in your community. They did not make any recommendations because every, I mean, what happens in Nashua or Manchester or Berlin um, or Groveton, New Hampshire is different than what happens in Concord. So they're asking, they're not really, they're not coming out with a recommendation, but asking us to use the data and then make the decision uh, locally. Um, there's generally an agreement that face masks are not necessary for outdoors. Just as we did in the spring, if you recall, um, we, we had masks and then we, 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 the students did not have to wear their masks when they're outside, um, whether they're passing t down to the fields or outside at recess, or certainly when they go outside, our teachers take our kids out for mask breaks so that we, um, there's not any need for masks outside. And I think you saw in one of the pictures that Matt showed that you saw the tents. And so all of the outside facilities and um, areas will, will be used again for our students so that they can be outside and again wouldn't have to wear their masks. Uh, we did uh, receive a technical advisory from the Department of Ed. Uh, this was back in June. Uh, commissioner, I, uh, we had a meeting with the commissioner today. He mentioned it again. Um, and um, the question was, may a school require COVID-19 uh, vaccination for attendance? And the, ab the answer is absolutely no. Um, we have no authority to mandate uh, COVID-19 vaccinations. I want to be very clear. We have no authority to do that. Um, uh, do we have, um, uh, may a school require that students who have not received COVID vaccine wear a mask? Um, or that they occupy a different place, a different space. And again, the answer is no, um, that uh, putting specific privileges based on vaccination status um, is just not um, appropriate. And um, so that's not going to happen in our schools. Um, and, and finally, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, I mentioned this. Um, uh, they recommended um, on masking uh, with low levels of community transition schools and child care agencies can safely choose to remove face mask requirements indoors based on your assessment of the local situation and risk benefit for doing so. Um, individuals who are concerned about their health um, or a compromise uh, can still choose to wear face masks. So that's the message that we got from the department. And they, they listed um, a number of ra their rationale for doing that. Um, if, you, if you take a look at it, I don't want to read every one of them, but they, you know, they, they want you to make sure that you have mitigation strategies. And I'll get into more of those in a minute. Um, what are the factors that put people at risk? You, got, you have to think about that. Um, um, Again, I think the what, what we have to do is what is the risk and what is the risk benefit for the use of face masks or not using face masks. And the last one, um, again, is to look at the um, data that we have relative to transmissions in the community um, and also the prevention strategies that we put in place. I want to note that um, on the school buses, the CDC has ordered, has an order applying <coughs> to all public transportation. I think you know that, including school buses. And we hear that about uh, airplanes and trains where people must wear a mask on those uh, modes of transportation. So that will hold true for our students who um, access our buses to get to and from school, as well as taking trips, uh, field trips and or um, athletic trips and events that we will expect that they will wear masks. Um, so again, I think the decisions around masking will be based on recommendations from all of the guiding experts and trying to take in all of that data. And we just posted some questions down below. These are the kinds of things that we talked about. What are the risks for long-term masking? 
Um, and then what are the metrics in the community? Some people wanted to know, well, what, what has to happen for you to remove those masks? What conditions would have to um, uh, sh show itself before you would make that change? Um, and, and other in, uh, information like vaccination levels in the community, and what kind of transmissions do we have in the schools? <coughs> and so we monitor, as you know, we monitor that pretty closely. But those are some of the questions. Um, the next um, protocol that has been used and we felt really worked well was um, distancing and maximizing the di distancing. Um, we will continue to recommend that we do at least three feet of separation for the youngsters, and that's where their desks are, cafeteria, um, you know, hallway passing, as, as best we can. And I, um, it, you know, it's not always easy to do when you have a high school of 1,400, and it's time to pass from class to class. And <coughs> just try to remember all of the developmental ages of these youngsters. Um, and so um, we, uh, they do a great job, but it's not perfect, and we try to remind the youngsters that they need to make sure that they do s distancing um, in those conditions. Ventilation, we worked really hard on this. Uh, kudos to Matt and his team. Um, we have been um, pumping 100% outdoor fresh filtered air through our exchanges, so um, that's the recommendation. All of our filter systems, you, you'll hear that a lot. Well, are they changing out the filters? Well, that's done on a quarterly basis, um, uh, ensuring that those filters are clean. And again, the 100% the, the air from the outside, again, is a rec recommendation, and that's work. We've done that all year long, uh, pumping in that, that, that air through fil filtration systems. Hand washing, um, we've heard this from long time, right? The flu, the colds, the strep throat, whatever. Um, hand washing is so appropriate, um, and um, we'll continue, um, our teachers and our nurses and our staff will make sure that that continues. Um, and um, obviously we make sure the kids understand good etiquette when they're coughing and sneezing and um, ensure, ensuring that they're covering up. Those are things that we teach kids in school and remind them. And I know a lot, you know, most of them will learn that at home, but we reinforce that. Um, most important, you know, when students don't feel well, um, you know, we need kids to not be at school when they don't feel well. Um, this, we're not going to be screening s students and staff at the door or require them to, to fill out screening forms. Um, the, these processes resulted in very low yield. They weren't really recommended by the D Department of Health and Human Services. We just didn't find that it yielded much. You know, we were taking temperatures on thousands of kids every day, and it yielded not the kind of information that really, really told us much. Parents and families were great when the youngsters didn't feel well. Um, for the most part, they they stayed home. If a youngster didn't feel well in school, the nurse took over. We had. We, we had a good system down um, where, where youngsters were isolated so that they weren't still, did not remain in the classroom. Superintendent, I, I know earlier we discussed that the district was investing in testing equipment. Is that still the case? And how will we, I guess, be using that on a- You must have known what the next slide was, awesome. John. Awesome. Um, and so screening, um, one of the things that we're going to use our ESSA money from, our federal money, is we are going to employ a full-time nurse. And she will be able to provide the rapid 19, <coughs> rapid uh, antigen test. So what, that, what does that mean? That means uh, youngsters uh, is in school, now they don't feel well. And you know what that means? That's the famous call home that the, the moms and dads don't want to answer because that means the child's coming home, they're at work, you know the hassle, right? Um, so um, this might help alleviate some of that because they can do a test. It, it might be a, an a allergic reaction, you know, it might be the fall, it might be, you know, it might be just a, a slight cold, whatever. Um, and they'll know right away if it's, uh, um, it's COVID-19 and then take the appropriate steps. So we will be able to do that. Um, we'll have the tests. We'll have the uh, staff member to do it. Our nurses will also help out. They've already expressed an interest in helping out and, and um, with that process. 
Um, but it's a quick way. We'll also do that for teachers. So if a teacher not sure, you know, they can take that test um, and, um, and they'll know right away. So we think that will help us, again, with uh, control and screening. So these are some changes. These are some changes you'll see, excuse me, from last year, um, again, um, from the New Hampshire Department. Um, only those exposed through household contact must quarantine. And by the way, that includes sleepovers. And we all know the kids have sleepovers. So that counts as a household contact, even though they might not be siblings or um, whatever, a cousins and family. Um, uh, so so non-household contacts in school, for example, are no longer required to quarantine. Um, they're asked to self-observe uh, observe and self-monitor for symptoms. So let's say we're in school and, you know, a case is identified of a student. Um, they no longer have to quarantine for the 10 days. But we're going to ask people to make sure, keep an eye on them. If they have a symptom, then you, you're going to have to respond and have the appropriate test done. Uh, vaccinated, close contacts in households are not required to quarantine. <coughs> so um, that's a, that's a ch slight change. Um, and positive COVID-19 diagnosis still requires isolation. So if you get a positive test, you have to be, you have to quarantine. So that, that, that one remains in place. <coughs> so we're, you know, promoting the vaccination. Obviously, it's a choice, but we are promoting it. Um, it's effective at preventing both uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic infection. Um, we know that um, in, in someone infected after vaccination, um, they, they, they don't, they're not as sick. It's a shorter duration of the symptoms and lower risk of severe illness. Just heard that today on the news, a senator who just got diagnosed with COVID and, and he had the shot, but it was not as, he was not as ill um, and, and his symptoms were not as severe. Um, and we will continue to work with the Capital Regional Health Network. They have been terrific partners in this work. And uh, we will um, offer a vaccination offer, vaccination clinics um, at the schools in the fall, as well as um, we're planning a, um, an evening out at Keach Park, and they have agreed to um, host some vaccination clinic out there when we meet with families um, in the park and, and, um, and share some of the plans for returning to school. We will continue to, to clean and, um, in, and implement all the regular routine cleaning that, that Matt and his team have done consistently in the district, um, ensuring that we have all the disinfecting protocols in place. So we will continue to do that. Um, I think I talked about this one a little bit earlier, social emotional <coughs> supports for student and staff. We know that the concerns around mental health is is going to be a priority for us. We'll have lessons in the classrooms. We have a uh, MTSS is multiple uh, tier system of support, and we'll have different interventions based on what students need. And we have ESSER funds. Remember, those are our funds from the feds. Um, we've added positions to help us with that: social worker, counselors, home visiting, and special education staff. We've also added some uh, teachers where. We thought the class size was a little high, and you know, um, uh, so we, we did we added a few positions there. We also added uh, some para uh, educational assistance uh, to some classrooms, especially with the young students who have not been in school yet. So, uh, or, or, or they're in first grade and their kindergarten year really got shortchanged. We're worried about their academic progress. So it's uh, what I would refer to as all hands on deck. Um, so that we can support our youngsters, uh, both uh, socially, emotionally, as well as academically. It's so critical right now. 
We had a great run this summer. We had great summer school programs. Kids were active, teachers were active, lots of tutoring and support of our, our students, but we know that when they all return, uh, we'll, we'll need to do more. Uh, I think I kind of mentioned the academic supports already um, for you and, it, and the interventions. And communicating, a um, little change we're recommending here. We will continue to notify parents and guardians of close contacts, um, even if quarantine is not required. So that will happen in the school, just as we have always done. If, if there was a contact, uh, the principal called uh, and let, let the parent know. Um, and uh, the parent will be informed um, by their child's class in school um, whether, whether they uh, were a close contact or not. And we will post information about positive contacts on our website daily. So we're going to have a dashboard. Um, PM's going to help uh, create that. And we'll have a dashboard and we'll include updated information uh, daily uh, relative to any positive cases so that our community can stay informed. I'm getting to the end here. Um, hang in with me. Um, food service, uh, obviously, we um, we will have we will continue as the federal government has provided all all students with free breakfast and lunch during the 21-22 school year. Um, we're going to ask parents if they can help us out, though. This is what where we really need some help from our families. If you um, think you're eligible, everybody's going to get free and re lunch. But if you think you're eligible, if you'd fill out the form, that helps us. And you say, well, why does that help you just to fill out the form? You know, parents, I know parents have a lot of things to fill out, especially at the beginning of the year, right? But it helps us because we use the data around all of our grants, all of our entitlements, the adequacy money that we get from the state to help defray the cost of education. We need those numbers because those numbers help the revenue stream that we get from the federal government as well as the state government. So I'm going to ask, we're going to keep reminding parents, if you think you're eligible, then fill out the form, even, you know, even if you're not sure. Fill it out and send it in, and we'll let our, our cafeteria um, director take care of the rest. And, um, but I, I think that would be a big help if parents would do that um, for us. Is this something we can encourage classroom teachers to assist? And I just remember as a coach, when we had the, the, the forms to fill out for um, the fee to do athletics, you know, so I have to collect money from kids. And if, you, if they thought they could get a break or they didn't have to pay it, it was my job as the coach to really facilitate the paperwork. So I, I understand teachers are already doing a million things. I was a teacher myself. But one more leg of somebody reminding or, or reassuring a parent I think it's a great idea, and we, when we talk to our principals and our directors, we'll we'll um, we'll emphasize that the importance. You know, teachers have um, teachers have great influence, and so um, uh, I, I think that's a great suggestion. We'll make sure that happens. And last, of transportation, we like we did last year, it worked out pretty well. We had a lot of families that drove the youngsters to school, um, and that was a big help. It kept our numbers down, not so crowded on our some of our bus runs, um, and we were able to get the kids to school in a timely fashion. Um, and um, but the parents did help us, and we really appreciated that. We had a few traffic jams on occasion, and we went out and. Um, sent the team out there and, and tried to alleviate that, and I think we did okay with that at the end, didn't we? Matt went out and, and Terry went out, so just to try to make sure we didn't have um, families hung up in traffic. And uh, so, with all of that, um, I would like um, to have, and we've already, I just sent out a note tonight. We would like um, tomorrow, mo tomorrow afternoon, we're, we'll have a, a Zoom session with all of our staff. We've already s I sent that invitation out on Friday. And just, just kind of go over the, the plans based on what you do tonight. And then um, open it up for questions. That We did that last year. Please join us. So, several of you joined us. It was awesome. You know, it was really good to have you with us. And then on Thursday, we have two sessions, one for preschool through elementary grade five, and another session for high school at 615 
for middle and high school families ask questions. Students can jump in, you know, the kids want to know. And then we, as I mentioned, we have a, a program at Keach Park, uh, in-person session. We have some interpreters in, uh, available to help us. We're bringing things like forms, and that include the free and reduced hot lunch and those, those kinds of things. Um, I sent out uh, Zoom links um, to the staff, and I sent the Zoom links out this afternoon to the families. And I anticipate, honestly, that I think we're going to probably, you know, have more opportunity for communication via the Zoom, and also my letters out to families. So, listen, tomorrow this could all change. I, I, I sit here thinking I have a plan. You remember last year we thought we had a plan, and it didn't quite go the way it, you know, we thought, and um, things change, and this is a fluid and a dynamic situation, and we're just doing the best we can, and I hope, I know families understand that. People have been really good about understanding the, the difficulties we, that you've had making these decisions. Did you want to have Yeah, it's coming up, yeah. Um, <coughs> summer school protocols. We we kind of we finished summer school, but um, we had a we, we had a great summer school. Um, we had three cases over the summer. We had two we had siblings and an, one adult. And we had a positive, and uh, that was all we had this summer. So that was pretty good. And last but not least, certainly not, well, I got a few more, but um, we have. Um, I can I can pick that up. Steve, you want to join us and talk a little bit about athletics and co-curricular and for our plan to return? Good evening, everybody. Hi. Good evening. I can't ask me to come tonight. Uh, I just want to assure members of the board and all the families out there that it's always our mission to provide our students, uh, students of Concord, the best athletic experience they can have. Uh, pretty proud of the fact that we were able to do that uh, through last year. Um, and regardless of what mitigation strategy the board decides to implement, uh, we'll be able to adapt. We have right now our least restrictive model in place. Uh, we can move very easily if you decide on a Monday night and on a Tuesday afternoon, or uh, we'll be able to do what we have to do. Athletic department is full of people that have devoted their life to uh, serving the students of our city and uh, are committed. I think they showed it last year. Our kids did, our families did, and certainly our staff did. Uh, we'll do whatever it takes to give these kids what they need. So if we're prepared. Uh, I think included in the packet is uh, sort of where we ended up in the spring. Uh, basically just indoor masking except when uh, during exertion. That sounds kind of like where we're going, but we're prepared. Uh, whatever you decide, we'll be able to go. Obviously in the summer we have a little extra time. We've got some trains coming up that have uh, intentionally waited until some decisions have been made. And I know Kathleen just mentioned that things change very quickly. I'm going to show you that we'll be able to adapt and we'll do it as safe as we can. Uh, Give uh, our students what they need. Any questions anybody Are the guidelines from the NHIAA much different than last spring? Uh, there really, really aren't any <coughs> far. Yeah, the okay. state, yeah. you know, have decided to put it on the, at the district right, right. level. Okay. I mean, there are recommendations from the NFHS, the National Federation of High School Sports, for instance, uh, you know, with cheer, for instance, you cannot stunt with a mask. It's what highly discouraged yeah. uh, because it's more dangerous to stunt with a mask. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when a girl stunt to be indoors, let's just say we're at this model, uh, they wouldn't have a mask on while stunting. It's not recommended. So things like that. Yeah. There are individual sports that have situations. Right. Right. And then volleyball, um, I guess that would just, again, depend on everything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Depends on how right. restrictive we want to be. Yeah. Last fall we started, uh, volleyball did not mask when they were competing, and by the end of the season, they did. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we were adjusted as we got. Right. So that's kind of the way 
Yeah. <laughs> the more things change, the yeah. more they stay the same. Right. So, <laughs> really here to assure you that we have, you know, plans in place. We have several new people as always, but I think very capable and very dedicated. And you know, we've had a couple of trainings already, but uh, we have another one planned after this meeting or even a little later, just to make sure that we're we have the proper information. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Mello? Thank you, Steve. All right, thank Thanks, you. Steve. Thank you for support. Thank you. I guess I would entertain any questions around the presentation around return to school. The only other piece that I have in, a, in my packet that I shared with you was um, tonight is the enrollment. I think that's an important piece for you to keep on top of. Now, I don't have all of the enrollment across the district, but this one has really, look at where we are. I mean, we're back almost to 2018's number. Um, I think we're at 284 right now, and um, and that's that was in that was as of uh, uh, July 21st. So we're ahead of the game, and which is really positive news. And um, and uh, I've I've I have to say, between Lyndon and I, we've gotten a number of phone calls of people moving into the district. You know, they bought a home, they they're going through the process, and I think you all know that real estate and was pretty hot here for, for quite a while, and I think we're seeing that in terms of numbers of students enrolled in our district, which is, which is wonderful. Go ahead. Sorry. I'll go after. Um, I know that when students register for kindergarten in the spring, they come in and they're evaluated. Um, are we doing that with, for kids that are enrolling up over the registering over the summer? We'll do it first thing in the school year. We did it already okay. in the spring, but we'll do it. We'll do yeah, it when those youngsters before. come in, we do it first right away. I, I remember that now from last year. They do it when they come in. It, when school, after yeah, school, when school starts. starts yeah. Yeah, but we do have a get ready for kindergarten program in all of our elementary schools. Mm -hmm. And they use results as they get to know kids and meet kids. So if they, if they arrive, they might be able to come to school for that program and, and get so we can start getting to know them and those are not all quite finished yet so we do have some programs still still going on Kathy, um, are there plans in place for students if, if we go with the masks back for everyone indoors are there plans in place for students who physically cannot wear them we talked a lot about that. You know, there are some students that, and there were very few, by the way. We talked to our special ed team, and um, there were very few students who could not wear it. And I know sometimes parents say, oh, I don't think my child will wear them. But, you know, when they're with their teacher, it's amazing. I don't know what it is. It's just, well, I do know what it is. It's the magic of a teacher that, that, that and it's not forced. It's just the kids do it. Um, but we do try to do some alternatives, and they are additional PPE for those teachers working closely with those students. When you think very, I mean, they have to. They have to be very close to the student. Um, we, we'll continue to do um, some of the plexiglass. We've, we have that. Matt has put plexiglass in wherever we felt like that close contact needed, needed to be. Um, uh, and again, I think the PPE for the, for the staff member um, for the student, um, if they can use a, the, the plastic shield. But when we talked to Dr. Noble, Dr. Noble in really indicated that the, the plastic shields do not do the job because they're not, you know, they're not encased around your, you know, nose and mouth. So um, they haven't been um, as, as um, <coughs> they haven't yielded the results that a mask would relative to keeping uh, the COVID. So, but we work with the youngsters. Um, we didn't have too many problems with that last year, and the staff really felt like they could handle it. So, that was a question that Gina brought up last week, and I think it was a good one. Other questions? One, one more point that I didn't make was about um, breaks for masks. I've um, heard from families that they, um, I heard from a, a mom today that a student didn't have a mask break, and we really, we really, really need to make sure that youngsters have a period of time, whether it's outside or an empty room. Like if you think about the gym and the gym's not being used, you can take your class in there, spread them out, and they can take their masks off. Kids love to be outdoors. I mean, they were outdoors last winter. They would go out in their coats and 
scarves and hats and and so we we will encourage those um, breaks for ma those mass breaks because I think they're really important and they're important for everyone our students are in our, our staff so it will be built into the schedule mr. Weinberg and to follow up on Ms. Hastings question we will provide extra equipment to teachers if the students they're working with are unable to wear a mask yeah, um, Matt has been our go-to guy um, for making sure that we have all that PPE, Jonathan. And awesome. uh, Matt, I think you just did some ordering. We did, um, and we'll be in good shape. We'll make sure that we have enough on hand at all schools. And are we facilitating it? Are, are the staff reaching out to the district to inform us if they will need additional equipment, or how is this communication? Well, we do it all through the principals, um, and they, they usually just do a direct um, call to Matt or you know or, or to Donna and I to, to make sure that they have it that's not been an issue um, good question Donathan but they're getting the things that they need the products and one, one last on that similar um, topic is I know nurses engage a lot with students how are we providing them with all the resources they need how are we communicating with them yeah they again another group that they use a lot of it and so all of those supplies everything they wanted um, some of the things were a little bit different received all of that material and again remember that's why the ESSA money was available to us we were able to do that because of the funding we, we, we met weekly with the nurses the whole group last year Matt sat in on most of those meetings so we, we had a lot of communication back and forth so they're very good about uh, their processes and systems for ordering. It, there's a very specific process and procedure they set up so that Matt knows what they need. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Hastings. We had a, a question from a parent um, in a note today asking if the um, class sizes at the middle school and the high school were being reduced at all. Um, no, I, I would say no. Okay. Um, uh, class sizes were fairly reasonable um, based on the numbers that we had last year but of course we'll keep a close eye on that you know that you have in classes that we can make that decision um, and hire staff as we need now I've already done that I did that at um, at the fifth grade level where I saw numbers um, climb uh, we added additional help in the elementary schools, um, pa educational assistance, but at the middle school, we, we feel like we're comfortable. We have teams. I know um, some of the teams are uh, teams of four, um, about not somewhere between 90 and 100 students on a team. They're broken down by four. So the class sizes are still under 25, um, which is, and, and, and they, all, uh, uh, they all meet the school board's policy around class size. So I want you to know we adhere to the policy that you set in place for class size. Obviously this year, we want to keep a very close eye on youngsters. So you want all your adults making sure that they're attentive to, to the students and using the staff. That's why you saw the additional staff members that we, that we hired this year so that we could do that. Okay, great, thank you. Additional questions? I have a... I have a couple. First of all, thank you, Superintendent, for your report and thorough. Um, I also would like to add, to relay the information to the folks who are watching or listening at home is how important it is to fill out the free and reduced lunch forms. Um, plain and simple, it lowers your taxes, right? The more forms we get in and they're successful, the lower our taxes are. This is having um, getting money in so that's that's critical. I also want to assure everyone that that information is confidential You're not being shared around um, So anything you fill out there is not so if you're even close or even if you're not close And you just want to fill it out and hope that our taxes go down. Um, I encourage you to do that uh, I also have a couple questions one um, We talked a little bit here and and I applaud the uh, the full the prioritization of uh, bringing the full uh, students back in person and all um, one of the key, key items had to do with um, hand washing mr. Cashman are all of our bathrooms this summer been upgraded and are fully functional in each of our schools they are runlet had some issues um, throughout mainly the multi-stall bathrooms but this week and last week I've had our plumber um, and our one of our maintenance people fixing the locks 
making sure that the sinks and the toilets are working properly. Any, um, you know, feminine hygiene products are, you know, in the entrance as you go in to the uh, bathrooms, and we're going to also upgrade and paint all of them and freshen them up for the start of school. So. Okay. And during the school year, are they periodically checked through the day to make sure that the supplies are in an adequate supply? And I'm thinking basically soap and... They are. They are in all, all schools. Um, there are occasions where, you know, they might get messy and it um, gets reported through administration or it gets reported to the head custodian and they go and they, and they clean. But um, that's almost to be expected during a school day. We have custodians in the school throughout the school day? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to make sure. Um, my next question has to do with ventilation, which was also identified as a key item. Um, have, uh, do we have any plans? Are we going to have um, any of the our ventilation uh, consultants or contractors come in and just check the mechanical performance? I know that our ventilation has been deemed adequate. The struct, mm -hmm. the design, and the uh, flows are all appropriate. Just wanted to know: um, Is there plans to check to make sure everything's working exactly as it should? So that's a great question, Jim. We have train and Siemens that were under contract on a yearly contract when they come in several times a year, or when they ensure the air flows meet what the system is is requiring. Um, so. Yes, we do all that. Last year we did bring in um, two outside groups to come in and check. Um, I felt that it's, and I still feel from the reports back that they're adequate. Uh, but I mean, that, those are things we can talk to um, in a capital facilities committee meeting or a board meeting like this if that's something you want to. Okay, I just Look like you to just check on that and if that's prudent or something we should do before school starts. Sure. And then. Um, the uh, just two more questions one with regards to traffic will the Concord police be planning to help us with traffic this year because on occasion there was some um, tie-ups and traffic issues associated with the drop-off period time that half hour or whenever and right. pick up what well, one of the things we do especially this happens at the beginning of the school year and you know there's a lot of excitement about returning so it's um, again we um, all of our staff including the staff here is all assigned to schools to help uh, support them especially at the beginning of the year and we also um, request help from the Concord Police Department they've been terrific they come out they and they enjoy it too, and the kids enjoy seeing them. <coughs> and, you know, and uh, last year at Abbott Downing, they had the, the the rescue dog with them, so the kids really did enjoy that. So um, yes, we bring them in, and they give us that assistance. Okay, good. Thank you. I have one more question. <coughs> you mentioned that there would be rapid testing um, at that students could be rapid test by the nurse. Would parental permission be required before any student would be tested? That's a great question, and I should have mentioned that, of course. Yes. Okay. You I just wanted to be without, sure. Yeah. I didn't no. hear it, can't and do I wanted to ask that question. Parental permission, right. Okay. Very good. That's that's all I have. Thank you so much for your answers. Anybody else have any other questions at this time? All right. I have two, just a couple things and finish my report, mm -hmm. and that's on page 14. You'll see that we did receive... Um, uh, the independent review, the auditor's report from the Department of Education, um, and uh, we obviously, um, Jack and his team work closely with them, and we got a clean bill of health from them. And then on, the, on page 15, I think, and 16, you'll see the um, report from the Department of Ed, Special Education uh, Department, around all of the criteria that we have to meet annually around um, the expectations from IDEA. And, um, and uh, I have to say that we did not have a single uh, area that we uh, needed to make a correction on. So I'm pretty pleased with it. I'm not going to read through those because you've already done that when you reviewed your packet. But all of the indicators uh, around uh, any discrepancies uh, that um, may be seen as they reviewed all of our data. Remember, we have to report all of this data to them in order for them to do this kind of accounting. And I'm very pleased that um, that we um, did not have a single finding. Excellent. Thank you. And I am finished. That's the end of that. Anyone have any other additional questions for the superintendent at this time? All right. Thank you very much.
Uh, next item in our agenda, item five, is uh, public comment on any of the items that is that are currently or is currently on our agenda. Um, there will be another public comment session for any items, even if it's not on the agenda, a little bit later in the meeting. Um, but at this point, uh, we will take public comment in conjunction with our policy 132. So anyone wishing to make a public comment, I would just ask you to please come up to the microphone. We have to have everybody be able to hear you, sign your name and uh, where you live on the sheet that is provided right there. And I ask you um, to limit your comments to five minutes, please, as, as covered. So there isn't any specific order, but if someone would just care to come up, go ahead, sir, if you'd like to, come on up. My name is John Griffin. I'm an associate degree in science and medical technology. I like to talk about um, the business of the mask mandate portion of the meeting. Children have like a 99.997% survival rate from the COVID, along with any other healthy young individuals into middle age. The overall death rate for the alleged Delta variant is 0.08%. For those of you that might think math is racist, that's eight one hundred of a percent. Noted that masks will not stop the spread of COVID. Okay, OSHA regulations require nineteen hundredths oxygen in a workspace. All right, I just recently, before the meeting, saw a video of a test where they did using a sensor, an OSHA approved sensor, with someone wearing a mask, a child, and uh, his oxygen rate with the mask on was 17.4%, which is below the 19% required by OSHA for workspace. So the, o the CO2 levels, wearing a mask, is what's giving children headaches, All right? It, it's oxygen deprivation. Parents in Florida had their children's mask tested in a state biological lab. The mask tested positive for numerous bacterial growths. And this also included meningitis and tuberculosis. Mind you, this is Florida, not New Hampshire, but this is disconcerting information that, for anybody that has bothered to look. All right, the risk of bacterial infection by wearing a mask for eight hours in school grossly outweighs any risk of COVID in, in today's setting, all right? The FDA has a class one recoil, which is the most serious type of recall for the Innova SARS COVID-2 antigen PCR test, and that's the nasal swab that's been in universal use. These have been used in great numbers in, in universities across our country. All right, there's a high, high amount of false test results with this product. And a statement from the Innova company was, do not use to screen or diagnose COVID-19 with this product, which has been used over the past year or so to give us all these positive cases that we see in the news. All right, a fear-driven narrative by the mainstream media or certain politicized organizations like the CDC does not give school officials a license for basically child abuse, forcing children to wear a mask all day. These children belong to your, their parents. They are not your property to do as you wish. The school board could be, you know, be possibly sued or charged with battery, as in assault and battery, for forcing children to wear masks. This is a liability that you should be aware of. All right, our own uh, exalted state epidemiologist, Mr. Benjamin Chan, he's an internal medicine specialist at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. He has subspecialties as a hospitalist and in infectious diseases. He is not a classically trained and educated epidemiologist. A hospitalist is a modern term for staff doctor. He has recently been quoted in the newspaper as saying that people should be getting the MNRA gene therapy to 
protect their communities, all right? This is basically Marxist communist doctrine masquerading as health advice, all right? There's been a lot of injuries and deaths attributed to the COVID-19 MNRA gene therapy. Most of the cases in Massachusetts, 74% of all the new cases of COVID reported through these faulty PCR tests have been with people who have been vaccinated. Now, the so-called vaccination contains the virus. This can set off the PCR test, the swab test, with just a little bit of NRA material can set it off. Whether you've had the common cold or the common flu, the test doesn't differentiate that between that and COVID-19, which incidentally has never been isolated in any laboratory anywhere. So my advice to you is to broaden your horizons when it comes to making decisions about mask mandates, because a lot of people in the state have a growing awareness of what's going on it looks like inoculation rates are going to remain flattened and you may see an increase in so-called positive tests and that's mostly due to vaccinated people not unvaccinated people don't take your information from cnn and msnbc news because that would be a mistake okay and i would suspect anything that comes out of the cdc for all the flip-flopping we're seeing from them and that concludes my little speech for tonight you may see me later discussing other matters like the Thank you, sir. Do we have anyone else that would like to make a public comment? Come on up, please sign sign in. Can I just ask you to speak up a little bit louder so or bring the microphone a little bit closer because that's the only way people at home can hear. Thank you. Okay, certainly. Um, I'm here to oppose our children returning in the fall um, with face masks as well. Um, I always tell my children never to be afraid to raise your voice for honesty and truth against injustice and lying. And um, what's taking place right now in our country is a real travesty. And um, only the truth can facilitate some real change. Every few decades, there is a dramatic change in how we view important societal and scientific problems. What used to be used as ridiculous yesterday can become the predominant opinion of today, only to turn into an obsolete notion of tomorrow. Misinformation is everywhere right now. The CDC and the mainstream media have been riddled with propaganda and fear, and it has paralyzed our country long enough. It's time to stand up and speak the truth. The truth that I know about masks and the virus is this. First, a virus particle is very, very tiny. It's about the size of 0 0.005 to 0. 3 microns. To put this into perspective, a virus is significantly smaller than mold spores, mold itself, bacteria, dust, coal. A cloth mask or a surgical mask is not designed to stop these tiny particles. It's basically useless. Uh, the CDC admits no conclusive evidence that a cloth or surgical mask actually work against COVID. There are no peer-reviewed scientific data to support that masks actually work. Thirdly, children run a much higher rate of getting sick by wearing a mask because they are constantly touching their faces. When you are adjusting your mask so you can breathe, you are then infecting your eyes, your nose, and your mouth, and this is how viruses and bacteria enter our body. Uh, four, you are breathing your own waste, <laughs> and
And uh, I know that this is something that none of us think is a good idea for our children. Um, fifth, the CDC also states on October 29th, 2020, that masks may actually increase the spread as well as worsen other health conditions, like we were talking about with asthma. Six, in September, the report by the CDC found more than 70% of COVID positive patients contracted the virus in spite of faithful mask wearing. Seven, the cloth, ma cloth mask or surgical mask are problematic because they retain moisture and have poor filtration, leading to a variety of respiratory issues. Eight, the California Globe also observed that the extensive randomized control trial studies and meta-analyst reviews of those studies have shown masks are ineffective against the spread of flu-like influenza, COVID. The Center of Disease Control found no significant reduction to influenza transmission with the use of face masks. Nine, many healthcare providers have been sounding the alarm citing that masks cause more harm than good. A group of doctors in Oklahoma are currently suing the mayor and the health department over the city's mask mandate, asserting that the masks cause healthy people to become sick. This is actually taking place right now. 10, OSHA, as we just heard. Um, you can go to the website, you can look at this yourself. The information is all there for the public. Um, states that employees shouldn't, that employers, excuse me, should not make their employees work in an environment where they have less than 1900% oxygen level and mandated masks cause people to dip below this oxygen level within 10 seconds of wearing them. 11, wearing a mask increases your CO2 leading to cognitive dysfunction. 12, there is clear evidence of negative psychological impact from wearing a mask, and I believe the long-term ramifications of this have yet to be determined with the kids. It's a real concern. 13, masks dehumanize us. 14, masks and lockdowns just don't make any sense. When you critically think and think about airborne viruses, it would be on all surfaces. And even during the height of our pandemic, we were allowed to grocery shop, exchange money. From a general perspective, if this was a real pandemic, we'd all be dead. 15, informed consent has fallen by the wayside with mask mandates. 16, putting something over your face makes you rebreathe your CO2 and become acidoic, making your body pro-inflammatory. What happens is the gas gets trapped. You become sleepy. You become tired, sometimes anxious, experience headaches, and even periodic nausea. It also makes your body pro-cancer. 17, it is unconstitutional to mandate a medical device on children. People have lost their common sense. We need to stop pretending that all the experts agree about masks and social distancing. What you really mean to say is that all the people who are allowed on TV agree with these so-called solutions. There are countless doctors, virologists, and epidemiologists who have been speaking out about the real science and these draconian measures for months, but they are continuously being censored and oppressed. Please reference Dr. Judy Mekovitz. Okay. Ms. Buscher, can I ask you to wrap up because you're Certainly. exceeding your time? Thank Wearing you. Wearing a mask is not saving lives. There is much more going on here. The virtue signaling needs to stop, and the muzzling of our children needs to stop. And I don't support the return this fall with masks. Thank you. Thank you for your comments this evening and for coming out to make them. Do you have anyone else who would like to make a public comment? Cer certainly, send it. and then state your name. Hi there. My name is Kristen Jackson. Um, I'm here to support our current mask optional policy. 
Um, I do think people should have a choice, so I'm not going to say anti-mask, even though I think we should not be wearing them. Um, I'm a school bus driver here. This means that I don't interact with and worry about one student on a daily basis, but I have 90 who I only want the best for and will do whatever it takes to make sure they have happy and healthy days. Um, as a bus driver, we're the first smile to greet these kids in the morning. We can set the whole tone of the day for them, and that has been taken away and downgraded so that they get a stare and a muffle through a mass greeting. They can clearly see and hear me, but then once they move into their seats, it's barely possible for me to have any interaction. You cannot tell me that this non-personal style of communication doesn't have an impact on these kids. I see the difference firsthand. I wanted to, you to think about the safety issue here also. I have multiple hectic stops on my route where over 10 kids get on at the same time. I cannot identify these kids. Let me say that again. If you were to line up my kids with their classmates that I drove for the whole year, I couldn't tell you which ones are on my bus. Please think about that. This is all wrong on so many levels. There are many, many studies out there that prove how ineffective and damaging mask wearing is outside of the medical setting. From what I've seen, many kids come to school, personal um, view here, um, seven hours they'll come in, seven hours later with the same mask on. Kids have the same mask multiple days in a row. They drop them on the floor and put them back on their face. They rub them with their dirty hands, ball them up with their pocket, and put them in their pockets. This is kindergarten all the way through high school. People do not understand <laughs> what the point of these masks are. Um, little kids take their masked faces and rub them on the windows and seats, and then they trade their masks for cooler ones. There are many articles pointing out how kids are not getting sick of COVID anymore. Right now, I'm sorry, but they are going to hospitals more because of respiratory issues. This is from breathing in the toxic germs that are on their masks all day. Um, I just want you guys, I, I didn't know the info you were sharing before this started, but that stuff that you showed, I mean, we were maskless all summer, and it's like, there was no issues. So that is such a good example. Concord is really good. We all try our hardest to keep our distance, and if we, I think we proved that we don't need the masks. Um, everybody was so happy. Teachers are happy. Bus drivers are happy. The kids are so happy to see faces. I missed a whole year of uh, kids missing their teeth. I didn't see, like, oh my gosh, I, I couldn't even, ugh. it's so, it's so aggravating to see this, like, child abuse happening like these kids are so sad they cry to get on the bus like there's so much trauma going on and it's like it's not necessary at all none of the the scientific facts the facts are backing this up it's just people feel better which i understand so if they want to wear masks they can but so many people don't need it and um obviously concord has like the ability to keep clean and not share their germs so uh i would like you to remember that that we did really good this summer and it should just continue on Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jackson. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to make public comment? Um, please come on up. We'll make sure everybody gets a chance. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. My name is Colleen Gaudet. I live in Concord, and my husband and I uh, do not have children that are attending school in the fall because our children have already gone through the Concord school systems. But as a concerned citizen, I am here to also speak to you about the mask mandate that is being considered to be required again for our children. Like you've heard from the people um, that have spoken before me, there are many resources that are available should one venture to look that will show study after study after study that proves that masking individuals does not stop the transmission of diseases. Uh, this, the woman who spoke, uh, Melissa, I believe it was, um, was talking about the size of the particle versus the size of the mask. 
And you could use the example of taking a pile of sand and throwing it through a fence because the size of the fence would be equivalent to the size of the mask and the sand is the particles. It just, it doesn't stop. Um, by requiring children to wear a mask, inadvertently you are promoting the idea that the mask can either pr prevent or treat a disease, which is an illegal and deceptive practice. It is unlawful to advertise that a product or service can prevent disease unless you possess competent and reliable scientific evidence substantiating that those claims are true. And when you have a box that the mask comes in that says this mask does not prevent the spread of COVID-19, then why are we masking the children and giving them an illusion that this face covering is a protective device, while also at the same time creating an element and a psychosis of fear in our children. When, as stated again before by the other residents of this town, that <laughs> the uh, infection rate in children is next to nothing. And my question is, why do we focus so much on cases when we now know that the PCR test um, is unreliable and when our state, as well as many other states, were running their PCR test cycles of amplification at cycles over 35, most of them were set at 45 cycles of amplification, when anything over 35 produces a false positive. So why are we relying on amplification numbers that guarantee a false positive? Why are we not focusing on hospitalizations? Why are we not focusing on deaths? Those would be a more accurate measure of severity of a disease than the number of cases. When this pandemic started, all we heard was, we don't want to overburden the medical facilities. That quickly changed to, we don't, we don't want to transmit disease. Well, we live in the world, it's going to happen. My other concern is the promotion of vaccination for a non-approved vaccine. It is an emergency use authorized vaccine. And to say that it is safe and effective is a lie because there have not been enough studies done because this is the first time an mRNA vaccine has been given to the public with a synthetic mRNA. So to say it's safe, you might want to think that, but there is no scientific data to support the safety and efficacy of this vaccine. So to pr again, why are we promoting something that's not federally approved? Why are we pushing it for children who have a very, very high survival rate? And with that, I will end. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you very much. Who's calling by? Yes, yeah. calling to that on the way. She's sunny. Thank you. Sir, thank you for, for your patience. Absolutely, thank you.
My name is David Fancher. I've lived in this area for quite some time. Uh, I've seen a lot of things come and go. Um, the sad thing that I'm seeing right now is the masking of our children, the masking of our adults, the ones leading the way and leading by example, which is kind of sad to see. Um, everything that's been stated so far by everybody else has been true. Um, if everybody goes outside of the Google search engines and goes into something like DuckDuckGo or any of these other search engines that do not censor what you search, you will find this information that uh, you would probably want to know because everything else is being misled uh, for a purpose and a narrative and agenda. Um, that's really kind of sad that's happening in our country. Um, I, I think it's a horrible thing to mask our children, and I wish everybody here would just not mask themselves because you're only doing yourself harm. And it's, it's sad and true. And I only say that because I care. I don't, I'm not here to, to rip everybody. I'm not here to destroy anybody else. We vote you in to do a job. We're, vote, we're gonna vote anybody else in who's gonna be willing to do the job. If you just take the time and actually follow and find the science, the real science, the actual science, then you will see what we are talking about and why we're here and saying what we have to say. And that's what I want to say to everybody here. So thank you very much for your time. And I do not vote for the mask. Thank you, uh, sir. If people want to have the option of the mask, that's by choice. Please allow anybody the option they want to wear. I just think they're doing more harm. Thank you for your comments this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Anyone else who would like to come up and make a public comment? Certainly, sir. Come on up. Hello, my name is John Goddard. I already met my wife. <laughs> students at the schools now. Our, our students were blessed with the opportunity to go through Concord's school system you know, seven years ago. And as Mr. Mello could attest, although I think he left, uh, not only was I you know, a parent for those kids, I was also a coach you know, for their uh, football, baseball, softball, soccer. From the time that they were young kids right up, you know, through high school helping out with the basketball team. As we go through this, these kids only have one lifetime of an opportunity to grow. One of the things that came up in that plan that hasn't been mentioned up to now was the health and well-being and the growth of those children, especially for our youngest kids. and see a smiling face, not just on our buses, and that was amazing. They need to see it all day. We have kids in this town that were told that they had to wear a mask, that they were sick, at older, just older than the age of two. How do you learn to socialize with other people if you can't read the social cues on their faces? Some of you, I can see your faces now. Others, I can't for that very reason, although I can see you're smiling <laughs> right behind it, right? The way the board came in tonight is the picture of what our town should be doing and a picture of what we should be allowing our parents to do for our kids. Allow them to make a choice. Some of you came in today not wearing a mask. Others came in wearing it from the parking lot. Some of you came in, sat down, and then decided it would be good to put it on for your own comfort. That's great. Allow our students and their parents to make those same decisions in light of the evidence that people spoke earlier today. And I will say this as someone who's volunteered in many places around town, I know that doing the job that you do is hard. And when issues like this come up, People sit here and 
want to bark and scream. And you know, we have a right to do that, I suppose. But we also want to acknowledge the, all the time and care and dedication that you put into this because we know that you don't have to do this. And I've seen it in Congo. You're probably not getting paid a lot. <laughs> right? You know? So we know you're dedicated to the well-being of the students. And we thank you for being open from whatever position you came in today to listening to what everybody here had to say. And with that, I'll leave you to your decisions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Gooder. Is any other anyone else at this time who'd like to make a public comment on um, an agenda item? Sure, come on up. Please sign in and tell us your name. Hi there. My name is Lynn Bloomquist. I um, have been in Concord in the Concord area for only a few years. Um, my grandchild is not yet a Concord student, but she will be in not too long a period of time. I want to echo what you have been hearing from the other um, participants in this public uh, discussion. Part of hearing your constituency is taking their concerns to the next level. I'm feeling pushback from the community on masking, and I applaud your recognition that you cannot mandate a mask wearing policy. The concern that I'm having is with the school bus. As public transportation, is that the purview of public transportation or is that school district transportation? Can anyone get on that bus if they're at the bus stop or is it limited to the children who are in that neighborhood? I think it's really, really important to recognize the boundaries and then to also push back on those above you who are tempted to filter down mandates that they're, they have no entitlement to. They're, they have no authority to make such mandates. So I'd like, I'd like you to take what you've heard from everyone here that spoke and raise it to the next level in representation of your constituency and your dedication and responsibility to the children here in Concord. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments this evening. The, we appreciate you coming down. Do we have anyone else who would like to speak this evening? I'd like to thank everyone who came down and spoke this evening, as well as everyone who sent us um, emails or called us. We appreciate and uh, you know, very much appreciate all the input from the community in helping us make our decisions. Um, thank you. Um, next item on our agenda is item six, which is personnel. Uh, Mr. Prince, will you be covering this? I certainly will. Thank you. The first item on this is from Mr. Gardano, who's a math teacher at the, at the middle school. His uh, confirmation as a math coach came to you last month, and he uh, did not get his request for a leave in time, so he uh, apologizes for the tardiness, but he has requested a leave of absence from his math position to become a math coach next year. Uh, yes. yes. Was, was that anticipated when yes, we yes. had the opening of positions? Mm -hmm. and, okay, yes. I just want to make sure that we're 
covered at this lane day. When I asked mm -hmm. him to, uh, um, if he was going to provide it, I think he was out of town or whatever and didn't get my message. People in are entitled to, to vacate. I just, <laughs> I want to make sure we, if yep. he's leaving and going, we're, we have someone cover it. That's yep. all I'm concerned yep. about. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, Ms. Walsh. This isn't in the packet. I, it was, it was, they're not in the packet. They're on the board drive. Why don't we place leave of absence on the, in the packet? We place all. It's a piece of paper. Mm. Uh, some are professional, some are medical, some are personal leave. So we uh, are, in most cases, we're protecting confidentiality. It's for those, it's really just the way we've always done it. This was a huge change. Um, Typically, superintendent, we often, I think, don't we often get them in a separate handout at the associated yes. with, the, you know, our meetings? Yeah. They're, they're uploaded to you, but they're not part of the packet, but they're uploaded to the Google Drive. We often will get a hard copy here as well. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I did not know that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'll make sure I, if that's what you like, I'd be happy to do that because we, we do. I mean, we have that material. I, I, I think the reason, you know, if it's a medical reason, certainly that can be. Sure. But I, I think we're voting publicly on leaves of absence, and I think if we're voting on something, the information should be available. Public, it's, it's a public item at a public meeting. So it, I, it, I think they should be included in the public packets and somebody, we should redact any information that violates right to know. Yeah, if somebody had uh, requested a year-long leave of absence, I wouldn't give you the name. I'd, I'd give you nothing, maybe the fact they're a teacher in this school. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. That's yeah. all. But. Yeah. Any other questions? Mr. Prince, are you looking for a motion to I approve am. this leave of absence? Yes, I am. Would someone care to make a motion to approve the leave of absence as presented so by Mr. Prince? So moved. Moved by Mr. Weinberg. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Ms. Higgins. Um, all, um, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The leave is uh, the motion is passed. So thank, thank you. you. Can Next you? item is an administrator nomination. Uh, Ann Fowler as the career and technical uh, education director at the CRTC. Uh, this is a new position, and she comes to us on a step three at an annual salary of one hundred twelve thousand one twenty four. This will be part of the uh, Concord Administrators Association. To assist Steve? Yeah. This isn't technically a new position because mm -hmm. you've always had um, a, an assistant to Steve um, that did all the program coordinating. Um, we, um, as you know, we spent a great deal of time searching for someone uh, because we know that in 10 months Steve uh, Rothenberg is going to retire. And um, so we um, spent a lot of time seeking someone who could, in fact, um, with appropriate uh, performances this year, um, step into that role. And um, tough position to fill. And given the nine school districts that are, attend our C CRTC and our own students, I might add 200 students, um, we needed to really um, step up and, and do that transition this year so that we had a plan in place. So this is the position. I had a chance to meet with her. She had multiple interviews at the school with the uh, teachers as well as the administrative staff, and, um, and her, her, um, her work was impeccable. So I'm pretty happy about it to be able to find somebody of her quality. Mr. Weinberg, you have a question. And the presumption is that Ann Fowler will assume the role of CRT it, if, director? Well, it, you know, I say that, Jonathan, but we also need to know that there is a performance requirement, and so we would expect that. One other piece I wanted to say to you that this doesn't, this the funding for this position is a vi virtue of the money that you have budgeted already under the program coordinator and Perkins money. So this doesn't add any additional monies to your um, to your budget. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. There, you anticipated my next question, which was the impact on the budget. So thank you. Um, other questions. Can yes. I, we're, so we'll basically have two people doing that job this year? Well, no, no, because we've always had a program coordinator there. There's always been a second person. And that person, person left. 
Right. That, okay. That's a. I'm sorry. I should okay. have said that. That's a vacant position. Has been vacant for mm. quite a while, okay. and did not fill it. And and then when we began to plan and try to think about down down the road kind of planning, when Steve announced his retirement, then I knew that I needed to really be aggressive. That's but fine. yeah, this is a position that was vacant. Okay, that clarifies it. The yeah, new position sorry. was confused. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have been more clear on that. Other questions? Would someone care to make a motion to accept this or to deny it? How I don't want to tell you how to make your motions, but uh, do we have a motion to um, to approve this position? So moved. Moved by Ms. Higgins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Smith. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? The motion passes. Thank you. And then lastly, we have teacher confirmations. Uh, first one, Steve Canale, uh, math teacher at Rutland Middle School. He's on the master's uh, track at step three at 55621 per year. Kayla Croto, a grade six classroom teacher at Rutland Middle School. She's on the bachelor's track of step nine, which is 66,800. Jacob DeBoer, a uh, math teacher at Renlet Middle School. It's the one year only position as, as he's replacing someone who took a math coaching position uh, on the bachelor's track, step six, at 58,919. Catherine O'Dowd, a math teacher at Renlet Middle School, also replacing a math teacher who took a math coaching position, so it's the one year only. Master's track, step six, at 63,501. Ashley DeVoe, a special education teacher at Abbott Downing School. Uh, this is a one-year-only position. Uh, master's track step one, 50,398. Silas Allard, an art teacher at Kristen McCullough School. Uh, bachelor's track step one at 45,816. And Christine Rhodes, a special education teacher at Kristen McCullough. Uh, this is a one-year-only position as it's funded with SRV money. Six, sixty-six thousand two fifty. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Hastings. Um, should is there reason for us to be concerned about all of the math positions that are suddenly available at the middle school? Well, they're for math. Uh, some of them are math coaching positions. One of them was, but we had two. We had a retiree. I think it's just a. Uh, coincidence to tell you the truth I don't think there's a concern okay there was a retiree there was a resignation okay so. thank you thank you Hastings. other questions would someone care to make a motion I would move that we approve the list that is presented motion made by Ms. Smith is there a second second seconded by Mr. Weinberg any further discussion? Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rich. Yes, Mr. Do we have a two minute recess? Of course. Um, I declare a recess for two minutes. We will come back at uh, 8.50.
the way the board is here. So. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. If we can come back and take our seats, we will um, restart. I think we went a couple minutes over, but not too much. So thank you all. Um, so at this point, uh, we are into the report from our um, committees. So uh, first would be Capital Facilities Committee. Ms. Smith, sure. I hand it over to you. OK. Um, Capital Facilities Committee met on July 21st. Um, where we primarily discussed the grade level analysis that was presented by HMFH Architects um, as we're starting to take the next steps for um, the planning for a future runlet. Um, as most of us have been talking about for a long time and realize it's a big Do we want our new runlet to be a five through eight configuration or a six through eight? So the architects really spent a lot of time looking at the elementary schools to see how our space is being used currently, if we have room in there to continue growing, or if we're sort of um, maxed out where we are. One reason that we kind of keep coming back to this is that um, there's thought that there may be a push for a universal pre-K program, preschool program. Um, and right now, we don't have that in all of our elementary schools. And if that was to come to be, we may not have this space for it. So they really took the time to go through each of the schools, look at how we're using the classrooms, and sort of see where we may have room or if we don't have room. Um, generally speaking, we learned that it was optimal to have an 8 to 10% extra capacity in our buildings to allow for population to fluctuate. excess capacity at 9.2, so we really are right in that range right now. Um, however, those numbers um, were based on the 2019 um, numbers that we had because we know that COVID really sort of skewed a lot of what we had available for data. Um, and as I mentioned, the preschool numbers, um, preschool would cause a need for shuffling some of those classrooms and resources um, as only two of our schools currently have preschool. So sometimes when we're sitting in these meetings, like, oh, why, you know, we're talking about Runlet, but we're really spending a lot of time with the elementary schools. Um, when we built the new elementary schools, the board at the time had the foresight to plan that someday kindergarten might become a full day option. And it did, and we had room to put those kids. Um, so now we're starting to think, you know, should we, um, alleviate some space in our elementary schools for preschool someday down the road and then should we bump our fifth graders to middle school um, where they aren't currently um, to house to make the potential for those preschoolers or um, another idea was brought up about what about a preschool center at some point um, it's just a, still at this point, unfortunately, a lot of questions. Um, we really need the community input on these things. We've talked about um, scheduling our next big public meeting for September or October to invite the community out to help us give their input, um, see how they want their kiddos to be structured in the schools. So we don't have a recommendation to bring forward to the board yet, but um, if you want to look through the notes, you can kind of see um, how the classes and the schools are set up now, where this space is and where it isn't. Um, anybody else want to fill in where I missed? Yeah, I think we got it. Covered it well. Comprehensive. OK, good. <laughs> anybody have questions can let us know. Do you have any questions? Not seeing any. Thank, thank you, Ms. Smith, for your report, and thank the committee. Uh, next up is Instructional Committee, Ms. Higgins. Thank you. So I want to thank Superintendent Murphy for basically covering the entire Instructional Committee in her opening <laughs> remarks. Um, the majority of that meeting on July 26th was discussing the return to school. So along with the mask issue, um, we discussed, you know, all, you know, you know, in-person learning and the, re the restarting of programs and uh, we reviewed the number of staff that the ESSER funds had provided for us to have extra teaching assistants and staff at younger grades particularly. Um, so a lot of the information was, again, already shared by Kathleen, but 
really to ensure that teachers have what they need to take a group of students that had a very shaky school year and get them off, off and running um, successfully in the fall. We also spent a great deal of time talking about the mask issue. Um, I want to thank our public for coming tonight. We didn't just sit here and sort of rubber stamp. It was a pretty contentious conversation. <laughs> Brenda and I had our moment. Um, um, for in, in the evening, but I, 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 I'm a firm believer that growth is never easy, and so our discussions were, were good. And, and I actually had to sit back and say, hmm, I have to rethink some of my thoughts. Um, the, the committee voted uh, three to one um, to support the administration's desire to require masks in the fall. And that, that, that this particular vote covers all grades. It wasn't different one grade level to the next. Um, and, you know, we went round and round with what, what do we predicate that decision on and how do we know when to ease back on masks or push further use of masks. And the, the conversation went back and forth between, you know, infection rate um, and vaccination percentages. Um, and there was great discussion around which one of those should we believe, which one has more credibility than the other, um, who do we believe, et cetera. Um, at the end of the evening, the, the, you know, the three to one vote was to support the administration's request that we require the students to wear masks inside at the start of the school year. Um, as the chairperson of this committee, I, you know, I, 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 I carry it heavily on my shoulders a lot of the times. I'm wearing a mask right now. I'm not afraid of some newscaster on TV telling me what the CDC thinks I should do. I have a husband with a kidney transplant and a newborn baby in my house. And I, if I'm going to breathe in dirty air, I prefer it be my own um, than someone else's. And so that's why I wear to wear theirs. However, if, if I were sending Jack to kindergarten, I probably would keep him home if there wasn't some sort of mask mandate just because my risk is high. So there's my personal connection to hoping that we have our students wear masks. That does not mean I'm right. Uh, it doesn't mean any of us are right or wrong. Uh, this, these discussions do not get easier. And a year ago, I think we were hoping that we wouldn't be having them anymore. And here we are. Um, so I, I think the time right now is for the full board to discuss what we present, it, present which is to support the administration's uh, request to require masks at the beginning of the school year. Um, and, you know, and if there's, you know, further discussion, now is the time to... Well, actually, we would first have to have a motion before oh, we could discuss it, but discuss if you have a recommendation or a motion. Well, I, then, uh, you know, as uh, the... Ch it's, it's behind you. We're going to put it up on the screen. Right, yeah. yeah. I'm Before reading Pamela, some. Good. <laughs> yeah. I'll read it, though, Pam. I'll read it. It is. That's exactly right. So this is the motion that the Instructional Committee approved uh, with a vote of three to one, so I would move that <coughs> the full board uh, vote to accept... Um, the motion which reads as follows, masks will be worn at all schools when indoors until the full vaccination rate in the city of Concord reaches 70% or until a vaccine is available to elementary school aged children and a sufficient period of time has passed to allow families who so choose to vaccinate their children. If community transmission rates increase to substantial levels, mask requirements may continue. All right. Thank you, Ms. Higgins, for your motion. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Miss Walsh. Okay, at this time, uh, this time we will have our discussion. So, Mr. Weinberg, I to clarify: full vaccination means fully vaccinated, correct? Two shots as opposed to one. Uh, yeah. Well, it this, would, yes. yeah, of okay. course, depend upon the vaccine. The right? vaccine, yes. Okay, on that one. So, thank you for that clarification. Um, is everyone clear on what? Uh, the motion is all right other other opinions comments discussion items I, I, you know I'm happy to talk about where okay. I, how I ended up where I ended up um, you know I was hoping that we would be you know I think when I answered the school survey I said I would hope the kids wouldn't have um, to wear masks this year and I think if the community vaccination rate was higher um, I'd be much more comfortable, which is why we sort of tried to um, trigger an ending, you know, what conditions would allow it to end, because I think that is important. Um, I appreciate there's differences of opinion on the science. I, I think, you know, as I've looked at it, I, I have to go with 
sort of um, what I believe are the most credible sources, um, the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, or, you know, or two of the biggest are um, state and local epidemiologists. Um, you know, I did felt thought a lot about the individual choice argument, and you know what we know about the mask science. And I, you know, readily admit that you know this is a relatively new virus, and so our knowledge is evolving. And if it changes further, I. You know, I would be happy to reconsider, but masks protects me. My mask protects me a little bit, but someone else's mask prevents them from spreading the illness more. Um, that's why when I go into my doctor's office and they think I have the flu, they make me mask up. Um, so, you know, elementary school age children, that includes a lot of our middle school, or some of our middle school kids, don't have the option to be va vaccinated. Once they do, then I think we're into the personal choice debate, and people can choose to be vaccinated, not to be choose to be vaccinated, and then there's different levels of risk. But right now, kids 12 and un you know under 12 don't have that opportunity to make, or their parents don't have that opportunity to make that decision. So that is why I, I you know. We went back and forth in high school. I might have been willing to let the high school students go, but I think that age group rate of vaccination is pretty low at this point. So, you know, we've got to assume that a lot of our students aren't. Um, and when I look at the trends um, in New Hampshire, we're very similar to where we were last year, and we're sort of in the inverse of Florida, you know, where we're outdoors during this time of the year, and so we're not spreading it, they're indoors more, and their 20% of their hospital beds are now COVID cases. I think that, you know, they have significant number of pediatric cases every day. Um, so that's why I'm supporting the motion. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Other comments and discussion? Mr. Weinberg. I think, thank you for all who came to comment. I think some of the comments reminded me that we need to talk about the frequency of washing of masks and I think that would be important if this were to pass is to make sure to educate all those that it is important to wash masks very frequently because they do accumulate germs um, and yeah I, I just think it's very important for us to remain to be proactive we've seen how the increase of cases with younger individuals in other states the Delta variants over a thousand times more contagious as we have seen um, uh, so, thank you. All right, thank you. Other comments or discussion? Yes, Ms. Smith. Sure. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just speak personally. I have three kids, um, and we are on the full range right now. I have a fully vaccinated 12-year-old. I have a 9-year-old who can't in masks everywhere she goes, and a 1-year-old who can't do either of those things. Um, the 9-year-old... It's sort of an awkward situation because she's, you know, she does, my 12 year old doesn't necessarily have to wear a mask anymore and my husband and I are both vaccinated. Um, but she knows that it's part of the bigger picture and protecting her baby sister and protecting the other kids in her class and protecting her grandparents who are older and compromised. And I think for us, instead of portraying it as a fear tactic, that if we're embracing that, you know, these times are tr truly hard. My one-year-old has only known pandemic life. That we're doing this for the greater good because we want to get out of this. I continue to embrace the mask wearing and will continue to probably start wearing mine more again as we continue on. So. I'm still in support of wearing the masks, um, and I, I like that these, um, this wording gives us some sort of end date or some goal to get to as a community. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Other comments? Yes, Ms. Hastings. I, it's just sort of a, a question for us to think about. Um, I think we were at 60% vaccination in Concord, close to? 59. Okay. So if we get to 70% percent 
vaccinations in this area, but there's still encouragement from the medical profession and, and the CDC and, and, and those groups that we've been following to wear masks, what are we going to do? I, 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 I think that you, we have to remember that CDC makes these uh, recommendations based on the nation across our country where we have all seen um, hot, hot spots and we've, you know, we've, some of the southern states who have been indoors, you know, and um, we've seen high numbers in those states. Um, and uh, so I think that um, we would use the data and based on our, our community and our school transmissions. And problem last year if you remember we had people were really concerned that we didn't go to remote and we were in hybrid we stayed in hybrid because the people that were infected were people in nursing homes at the local prison those numbers didn't affect us they were very cloistered numbers so when I was trying to make a decision remember and we, we were trying to make that decision about whether to go back to remote from a hybrid it was really the numbers were higher in Merrimack County because of those locations. I, su I, I suggest to you the same thing. We're going to have to look at it and look at our individual, what's happening in Concord in our city. And by the way, how did our kids do? You know, we've always used our students as barometers as to whether there was a problem or not. Um, and because of the precautions that you've taken, we didn't have trans a, a transmission. And what I mean by that is student to student teacher to student, uh, uh, you know, vice versa. So that's what I would look at in, in terms of, and, and with you to, mm -hmm. to decide whether, because, you know, I, I, can't, I would, in a heartbeat, if we get to 70 and we're seeing an increase in number of vaccination, mm -hmm. vaccinations, just change, move. It's easier to remove the masks to put them back on. than it is to put them back on, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that's not why we made that recommendation, but it will be easier. The other piece is the transmission of the virus. If I sneeze in a mask, it, I'm less likely to get goobers on her than if I'm not wearing a mask. And so my fear if I had to send a child to school would be my husband getting sick. Somebody, my very healthy child comes home and it can transmit the virus. I think that's a bit, that, that in some of the emails that I've received from, from families, it's been that. You know, I have my, my mother living with me and if it came into the house, that sort of thing. But again, these, these barometers, give us a, mm -hmm. a relatively safe other comments go ahead Ms. Gannon. i guess i just i'd like to address the not being able to see people's faces mm -hmm. um yeah, that's, a that's really tough it is really really difficult it's difficult for our kids it's difficult for us for kids and adults on the spectrum who already struggle with social, it's nearly impossible to read social signs with this much of somebody's face. Um, so I want to acknowledge that that's really, really exceedingly difficult. And, and I get that. Um, but I still think we need to err on the side of caution for those people who cannot at this point, choose to be vaccinated or not. Um, we're in this together as a community. I, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of wearing a mask, but we're in this as a community, and we have to protect those people who cannot, at this point, protect themselves. Okay. Thank you. Other comments? Go ahead, Ms. West. Um, and I agree with that, especially at that elementary school age, those children can't be vaccinated right now. Um, and so that's a reason why I supported uh, this motion with the instructional committee. And then also when we talk about choices, um, and Barb, you keep bringing up, you know, the folks that you have at home that you're worried about, I think about um, how deciding not to have a mask and potentially being an asymptomatic carrier takes away your choice to have a healthy family. Um, right. And so in, I also agree that, you know, in order to protect 
those folks that are most vulnerable, we need to just all be wearing all the wearing masks at the beginning of the year. Okay. Thank you, Ms. West. I guess uh, everybody's voice that's at me. I uh, will admit that uh, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I was very much in favor of recommendation. Um, in that time, I want to thank everyone for their input and their emails, phone calls, and personal uh, communication to me. Um, in that time, I've also seen firsthand, um, and then while it's a small sample set, I, I've seen a lot a significant increase in the number of people who have been infected with this, including younger people. So uh, at this point, I would be inclined to um, vote for the uh, the recommendation based on that information. So um, does anyone else have any other discussion items? In that case, uh, I will call a vote. Uh, does anyone wish this to be a roll call vote or do we want to just do a voice vote? We're all here. I think a voice vote is okay. Voice vote is, uh, unless another member calls for it, then the voice vote seems fine. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Are no. there any? One opposed? Um, any abstentions? All right, then the motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Oh, Ms. Hastings. Okay, I just have to. Nope, that's okay. Is there anything else on the uh, from the instructional committee? No, that was the uh, really the. We've seen those as well, so um, nope that that would do it. All right, I'm sure this mask uh, discussion will be something that will continue uh, as we go through the coming months. And yes. it should. And it should. Right. Sure. Of course, this is not a you know this is a dynamic situation and one that changes uh, can change frequently. Um, thank you, Ms. Higgins. The uh, next item on our agenda is the Communications and Policy Committee. Uh, Ms. Cannon. So uh, there's no report because the Communication and Policy Committee did not meet last month, but we are here for a second reading of the student records and access policy. Um, aside from a Scrivener's error in the board book, which has been corrected, um, basically there were no changes at this point to the uh, policy and so the communications policy recommended that this policy be approved after the second reading. So I would make a motion that the whole board approve the new revised policy 580 student records and access policy. Thank you. Motion made by Ms. Cannon. Um, I will second that motion. Um, is there any discussion with regards to policy number 580? Very good. Um, in that case, all those in favor of uh, policy 580 um, as presented in its second reading? Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Is it, didn't you email about, um, no, just kidding. <laughs> no, a point of clarification is always welcome. So I want everybody to be aware. Yeah. yeah, you did email about that. I did, but I didn't make any changes. Oh, well, okay. I thought that that change was a good one. Uh, this, is there, this is still discussion, go. Please go ahead. It, it was just um, to have the, his or her, her change to them, which was in the email. Right, and I think, you know, going, going forward, it, it's just that it's difficult at this point after the second, at the second reading because things should have been sort of changed before now. Um, and this policy is likely to be revisited because there was another issue that was raised. Um, but you're looking confused, Kathleen. The, yeah, the question was, was changing she, so him, her, she, she, he, her, know, he, she, to she, they. I think it was he, she, to they. Uh, Gina, I think mm -hmm. if you want a mm -hmm. second reading to make mm -hmm. some changes and the board allows you to do that, you can accept the policy as amended. 
Uh, yes, I believe I that is the. That. I believe that is quite possible. So we and could we can still come back with this policy again. Right, but, long, but okay. All right. Well, if we, we can if, do that. if we want to change the, I, I'm not even sure where that. I'm looking is. at one under G1. Um, there were a few areas from what I. But right, it's so he, I she, you. and the yeah, recommendation yes. would be to um, they. They there, yeah. And I think in this case it's they, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm looking for another one, just as clarification. Uh, G two yeah. under the paragraph under E. There are a few. Yeah, that was what I saw. Daniel, page 38, the second paragraph. That's the second. Oh, okay, great. Good, good, good job. Okay. Yes, so I see the that. Well, that. Um, yes, so his, her would be there. And those are the suggested changes that you'd like to make an amendment to the policy for? Yes, please. All right, so the motion is made to amend the policy uh, as presented substituting they for the he slash uh, she and substituting there for him slash her and other whichever other grammatical one would be appropriate to to make it they their them um i believe that's pretty accurate uh is there a second to that motion second seconded by mr weinberg is there discussion further discussion not seeing any discussion. Um, all those in favor of that amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Are there any abstentions? The motion passes. Ms. Cannon, continue. Okay. Well, then we need to make a. So we amended it, but your motion, I guess. No, we have to approve the amendment. Approve the policy. motion as amended. Right. Approve the policy as amended. Yeah. Right. Okay, and did you make that motion? I believe I did. so. Yeah, and you seconded. Yes, so I'm fine with the amend. Well, it doesn't really matter. I guess it's amended. Because it's so amended. We'll so, <laughs> any, I guess so. So, any further? Sorry, as I work my way through this, I appreciate <laughs> everyone's patience. Um, any further discussion? All right, with no further discussion, last chance. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the amended policy, please signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? The policy is approved and motion passes. Um, let's see. Uh, report on ad hoc committee for anti-racism discrimination. I don't believe there was a meeting, but is there a report from anyone? We will be having another subcommittee meeting uh, to go over the matrix tomorrow. And then I believe we will be continuing into the school year planning um, the future kind of planning. Okay. Any questions for our representatives on that committee? All right. Thank you very much. Um, next item is update on superintendent search. I will take this one to say that uh, we are um, continuing our work towards uh, the permanent superintendent um, after because uh, the, uh, the inter our interim superintendent's uh, contract expires in G end of June. Uh, I don't have any additional reports at this time. Are there any questions? All right. Uh, proposed calendar of meetings. I do well. Does Superintendent, you want to lead the proposed calendar of meeting discussion? I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Um, so your August meeting, um, as, as Gina told you, we, we was scheduled to have a meeting on Wednesday, a policy meeting, but we've, um, we've moved it to the 25th of, of on uh, August, if you want to pencil that into your calendars, but we'll refresh your calendar. But is that the 20, what do we yeah, have? Yeah, we moved it from the 4th, originally scheduled, to the 20th. And what was this? I'm sorry. The policy it. committee. Policy. Yeah. Um, that was a in one of your original calendars. Right. To be 
confused, where did that go? Just a couple things that this week, too. That I reminded you the teacher forum uh, tomorrow at 5 o'clock and then parent forums um, on the 5th at 5 and 6.15. So um, those aren't necessary. You don't need to be there, but you're more than welcome to be there. Um, fall, next week, we have capital facilities and uh, community relations. You guys have been down, t down at the State House. Want to... Uh, How's that going? It, so th thank you for the invitation to speak about it. It's been going very well. Um, more people speaking to us every single week, and it's been great hearing from constituents about what's important or just providing the outlets for the resources available. Um, on that as well, uh, we will be at Market Days, um, which is the 19th to 21st. So board members, you'll be receiving an email soon. Um, <laughs> And as well, if anyone would like to speak with us, we will continue to be at the State House um, from 8 to 12 on Saturdays. Thank you, Kathleen. And we did two, you. we did, you, the committee asked for two, um, two things. One was some type of a banner to, you know, we, we use that in, in a lot of a variety of ways. So we have a Concord School District banner that Linda ordered for us and it should be in soon. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. And we created a trifold, a, a, a pamphlet of information, basic information about the district that you can use to hand out. And it's not, you know, it's not pictures and all that. It's about, you know, attendance and staff and how to reach people and school board members' names and your your email. That just general information about all in a nice little trifold that you can pass out. You needed something to more than just, you know. Talking, not that, that that's important to you. More than candy and water. Yeah, more than candy and water. <laughs> is there is it possible to get a one-page map on the middle school project? I think that would be helpful yeah. for people to understand sure. what the yeah, we could various we input could points are and decisions for sure. the community. Yeah, that's a good idea. I think that's great, Mr. And Mr. Cashman. Can you coordinate that that's with sure the can. capital facilities chairperson and? Right. I think that would help, and sure thank will. you, Superintendent, for uh, providing the information you had for that. Um, we have a, on the 16th a negotiations committee meeting scheduled, and just think about it. You know, you have five contracts up this year that uh, require uh, our attention, so mm -hmm. we want to be able to sit with you in, in a, in a non-public meeting and discuss those parameters of those upcoming negotiations. So. We want to be able to do that. So the 16th is a non-public meeting? Yeah. For Thank you. For you to discuss negotiations. All of our contracts this year are done, signed, sealed, and, and delivered. So we're good with those. It's, it's, it's what's coming ahead of us. Market great opportunity for the a board again to showcase executive committee and instructional. Now we moved instructional committee on the 23rd uh, so that we could, in preparation for school opening, you know, we're getting closer, and I'm, I'm concerned <laughs> that what we said tonight won't be here tomorrow, you know, so we have to anticipate that. So I talked with our chair, Barb, and, and uh, she, she agreed that we should have that meeting. We'll have it after the executive committee. Uh, thank you. I will not be able to attend that executive committee meeting, so if the vice president yes. would care to, uh, to chair that, I'd appreciate it. No thank you very much. Okay. And then I, I already mentioned the 25th being the policy meeting, and so we'll have some new policies uh, to begin to grapple with. Um, we already have a couple that we have drafts ready to go, and um, so. And then um, Karen Fisher Anderson, as you know, um, under her contract, she'll return to the district on August 16th. She does not work; she's not a year-round employee. Um, September, uh, first day of school. I've said it a few times tonight, but um, first day of school is the best day, and. Uh, um, it's just wonderful to see, and so on Wednesday the 1st, we will celebrate all of our youngsters coming back. A school board meeting is a little change in the month because the first Monday of the month is a holiday, Labor Day, and so your meeting will be moved to the 7th. Which I will not be here for, but would love to attend via Zoom. I will be out of town yeah. again. Because of the holiday, I've missed up my right. oh, away time. No, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll I'm assuming a September meeting would be a pretty important one. Uh, very important, yeah. since I'll be able to update you on the opening and any of the issues that we've been have to deal with. Um, and then and you just need, if you would be so kind as to notify me um, in, as to the requirement or the reason you will not be able to attend. Yes. So per so that we can do that per. Um, we'll have a 
have another instructional meeting on the 8th um, again because there'll be things that arise um, um, with the opening that we want to discuss and, and then continue to move on here. We, we have lots of things happening and so it will be important to have that meeting. Yeah. Uh, capital facilities again in the middle of the month on the 13th and policy on the 15th. Uh, the 20th of September executive committee uh, with negotiations following that meeting and community relations on the 22nd and Jack uh, asked for a finance committee I think he talked to you Pam on the 27th to review finances and um, and prepare for uh, the end of the year report that is it in a nutshell All right. Anyone have any questions or comments with regards to the upcoming agenda? The calendar meeting? Okay. Um, in that case, we are to item number 13, uh, public comment on any topic. As I had said earlier, please um, comment in accordance to policy 132. We very much appreciate everyone's emails and phone calls if you're not able to make it here today. Um, on those you can send to us all throughout the month too. There's no limited time on that one. Um, with that, is there any public comment on any topic whatsoever? Yes, sir. Please. There were a few things that were brought up in the discussion that I just wanted to give folks some food for thought. Um, you know, the thought of my mask is to protect you and not me. The mask works the same in the both directions. If I put my shirt over my face and I turn my shirt inside out and do it again, same air transmissions going through. Same thing happens with these viruses and the mask. As far as doing it for the community, we have had immunosuppressed people in the world since the dawn of time. And before COVID, nobody asked everybody to put on a mask or stay home. We expected that those families would do what they needed to do, make their individual choices to take care of themselves. I would expect that the same could work for, for COVID. And I'll leave it with this. I know that while masks don't stop by, I've yet to see anybody sneeze in their mask. They all take it off and sneeze somewhere else. <laughs> with that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. I appreciate your comments. He's not been with kids. <laughs> yes, sir. He's right in those masks. Oh. Can you please? But then they don't wash them. <laughs> would leave them right on. Would you please sign in, sir? Thank yep. you. My name is Ray Pinard, and I live here in Concord. Um, I wish that the board would have put up the motion with regard to the uh, mass mandate before the public comment session. Because if you read that motion very carefully, it's quite faulty. And there are a lot of holes in it that allows the board to continue the mass policy for a long time. Now, I have a simple question on it. If we're at 60% vaccination, full vaccination in Concord, what if we only get to 63% and it never goes higher, but then a vaccine for children come out, comes out, it might not go down to pre-K for sure. And I think there would be a lot of parents that would be very hesitant to have their kids vaccinated at that age. So let's say 20% of the kids up to 18 get vaccinated. So now, the way your motion is written, now you remove the mask mandate with 63% of adults and 20% of the kids, or 5% of the kids, because you said there just has to be one available. Mm -hmm. But that really does, doesn't change 
the economics of this whole thing as far as how many total people are vaccinated. And then you can't just look at Concord either. That's a fallacy. Because there are many towns that border us, and many of those people come to Concord every week or every day to go to work or a shop. So you have to consider that too. I'm not in favor of the mask mandate at all for all the reasons that were previously spoken. But I'll just wrap up. You, sh you gotta look at that motion again because it's quite faulty and it allows the board many outs to continue the ma mandate indefinitely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any further public comment on any topic? Thank you, Mrs. Hastings. There are many in this room that abide by the slogan, my body, my choice, in reference to abortion. And yet when it comes to my body, my choice, for the children, you have very easily made a decision for them. I just wonder what the difference is between the two. We live in a constitutional republic. We have a Bill of Rights. And the Ninth Amendment states that any amendment that's not, and any right that's not specifically stated in the Bill of Rights, the government can't infringe upon those. Just because it doesn't say it, you can't take it away. Those children have a right. They have a choice. And you've taken that away. You've infringed upon the rights of those children and your staff, the teachers at the school. You have taken away choice for the greater good. I'd really think about that because that leads down the road to tyranny. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy, for your comments. Does anyone else have any public comment on any topic? Not seeing any, I'll close the public comment sec section. Thank you, everyone, for your, your comments and um, your contact and information for us. We, it is greatly appreciated. And um, we certainly hear everyone and value uh, the input. Um, Superintendent, do we have need for a non-public session tonight? No, we don't. In that case, we can, uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Ms. Hastings. Second. Seconded by uh, Ms. Higgins. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? We're adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.